Hey, well, good morning. And I was just, I don't know why, I think strange things, and guys that go to my church know this about me. Or if you listen to the radio, <laughs> it's amazing. When we first started on K-Light, my wife was like, you know, you got to start being really careful about what you say now. And uh, and for some reason, I don't, I don't think sometimes. But listen to your wife. She's usually right. But something, I don't know why I thought this just now as we were sitting here. I was thinking, you know, this is different from a wedding. But at the same time, you know, you guys are the bride. And it's such a cool thing. I mean, and you know, as a man, it's like I don't want to be the bride, you know. But, but you know, always, always, what is it? Always a bridesmaid, never a bride. You guys, we are the bride of Christ, and it, and it's beautiful. And the Lord looks at us, and He loves us. And I, and I was thinking about when I, whenever I do a wedding, not always, but and my wife's told me not to, but I do it often. I'll sit there and 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 I and I. In, invite the people, let's all stand. Don't stand now, but, but I'll say, let's all stand. And as the bride gets to the end of the aisle there, you know, and she's facing me, and I always have them, I tell them ahead of time, stop right back there. Right when you get there, just stop and let people just like take it all in. And, and it's also so that I can, right when she's there, I, I take a picture when everybody's looking the other way. It's pretty fun, pretty cool. And then I send it to them later. It's pretty cool. And I try to get back, so I got. Here's the groom looking at the bride. But you guys, the groom, the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, he's looking at us always, and he's waiting for that day that he comes for us. And he would tell you and I this morning, stand firm and hold on. And and I love the text that, that I got this part of the text. I was like, this is so cool. I love it. Stand firm. And I, and I in, the, in the NIV that I'm using for this this morning, it's the old NIV. I don't really like the new NIV. I don't, if you got one, it's okay. But I don't really like them. They can't get them anymore. you got to order them, the 1984 edition. But in it, it says, stand firm and hold on. And I thought, when we know, hey, that Jesus Christ is coming soon, that's just it. Stand firm. Hold on. Start, you know, hold on to your seats because he is coming for us and he loves us. And, and so with that in mind, how much he loves us and how much we ought to then love one another, let's let's pray and we'll jump in here. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I thank you for the promise in it, the reality, the proof, the truth, Lord, that we hold in our hands that's eternal, that's forever. And Lord, I pray that this morning, Lord, you would challenge us and you would change us inside out, Lord. For your glory, Lord, for your glory, and that we would, Lord, even as we see in your word this morning, share in that glory in an amazing way. Just as we would want for our children to enjoy the best of all that we have, Lord, you want the best, the inheritance that we have ahead. Can't wait for us to see it, I know, God. And so we just, we wait on you and give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Hey, so as we jump in here I just, I'm going to share, just like Strat said, I'm going to try really hard to stay with just my notes because I, I want to, I want to finish on time, but, but read with me, looking at chapter two, verse 13, second Thessalonians here, and we'll read up through verse five of chapter three. The apostle Paul writes, but we ought always to thank God for you, brothers loved by the Lord, because from the beginning, God shows you. To be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. And he called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold on to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter, even our studies this weekend. And may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. May he encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Finally, brothers, pray for us. Pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not everyone has faith. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing, and you will continue to do, the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. 
in that, stand firm, and hold on. So, continuing in our text, Paul is warning about the coming of the Antichrist. And just as we've heard, his ways and his false signs and wonders are going to be evident. We already see some of that, I believe, in the, in the church, even in areas of the church, of falling away, apostasy, and a running after signs and wonders in the church today. His great deception, again, is could easily be seen because if we see believers being beguiled even today, how much more all the rest of the world, and some that believe they're believers, that, but they don't really know him. Jesus said it. Many are going to say on that day, you know, Lord, Lord, you know, we cast out demons, we prophesied, we did miracles in your name. And he's going to say, away from me. And sadly, away from me, you workers of iniquity. They could have had so much. I never knew you. Jesus wants to know us. And he, and he wants to protect us. And so I love it as we read in verses 3 through 4 in, in, just in, this, the, the begin, in chapter 3, right, where we left off there. It seems that Paul is not particularly worried about his brothers. He says in verse 3, look at chapter 3, verse 3 real quick. And we'll come to this again later. It says, but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing. You're going to continue to do the things we command. So he's not necessarily worried about them, but he has reason and he has warning for them clearly. And God has retained this for us so that we might know it and pass on these things to those who we know who would be, who may be beguiled, deceived, even after the rapture, deceived by the Antichrist, as Tim was talking about. And I've heard people say, you know, oh, they'll never put a mark on me. You know, if, hey, if your rapture comes, you know, then I'll see it and I'll know. Listen, just as sure as we have the gospel of Jesus Christ, there will, will be a very real lie and deception of the Antichrist. And the bottom line is, if you can't live for Jesus Christ now, today, I don't know what makes people think that they'll die for him then. And the Bible is pretty clear that they won't. Again, look back at chapter 2, verse 11, just quickly. For this reason, verse 10, the reason, because they refuse to love the truth. You know, to, to receive me, Jesus would say, and then refuse to be saved. They refused it. Radical. God sends them a powerful delusion so that, so that they will believe the lie. And so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but they delighted in wickedness. And so for those that just say, hey, I'm just going to party hard and I'll switch sides when it all comes down, if I need to. Listen, Paul warns us, it ain't going to happen. It won't happen. You know, and you laugh, but there's people that believe that. You guys... This is, this is truth, and it's so important for us to know. I mean, a quick, honest question for you and I is, what is it that you delight in? What is it that you spend most of your time thinking on? You know, spend your time looking at when it comes to online or on TV and all these things, you guys. Is it truth? Do you spend time in truth or wickedness? You know, is it, is it what's, you know, you know, the... the I was going to say the passing of a rose. I have ne I've never seen that show. You know, what is it? The, you know, huh? Bachelor. The Bachelor. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I get help from our congregation all the time. I turned 62 and it's like everything's like, you know, I need somebody. I need one of those little earpieces like Benny Hinn has, you know. You know? <laughs> Make me look good, honey. You know? But, but she got, where was I? Oh, yeah. <laughs> See? But what is it that you delight in? What is it that, that, that people would see if they were to watch you? What is it that the Lord sees that you delight in? And finally, here, look at this. And this is so great. And this is the kind of stuff we need to be hanging on to. Verse 13, but we ought always, are the opening of the verses that I was received, but we ought always to thank God for you, brothers loved by the Lord. I love it. That's, what we, that's why this is so good. We've been coming, I don't know, 20, how long have you been doing this? 29 years. We've been coming 27 years since we first started Calvary Chapel in Lahaina. And, and, I, and it's been awesome because you come and you're there with brothers loved by the Lord. And, and, and from the beginning, he says, God chose you to be saved. Brothers loved by the Lord to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. And he called you, verse 14, to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so how good is that, that we get to share in his glory, that we are, we've been in First John lately and talking about the idea of being a, a part of, of the, the, the kingdom that is to come as, as the Lord raptures his church out of here. And after the tribulation, we come back and we have a thousand years ruling and reigning with Christ on the earth. In heaven, there will be no ocean, it says in Revelation. But for a thousand years, we got the ocean here. And as big as, as big as it gets, you can't die. You know, I mean, is that cool? And for those of you that don't surf, you will. I mean, it's like, I mean, <laughs> but you guys, it's, and, and to be, I mean, to share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, I deserve nothing. I grew up in a strong Christian home and I wasted so much time and turned my back on God. And, and then he's, he's, but he's redeemed me and he's restored me. And then he says, you're going to share in my glory. He goes, how good is that? But how fair is that to be chosen and called, and, and then others are going to be sent a powerful delusion? Why is that? How is that fair? That they'll believe the lie, you and I won't. I hope you won't, I won't. But so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness, as we saw back in verse 12. But for others, you know, for we, those that believe the truth, we get the Holy Spirit, they get deceived. We get saved and set apart to God. We get to share in the glory. How is that fair that God chose some and that God called some, but it's a delusion for others that they will believe the lie when it comes, follow the liar, the Antichrist, when he comes? Good question, fair question, common question. Understanding here, there's there's two distinct descriptions of man found in the Bible. There is the man, and we see it from Old Testament to New. There's the man that, that bows, he's really sees God and bows and is changed. And he prays, Lord, thy will be done from this day on. Lord, you are God. In my life, it's going to be now about you. As much as I'll struggle with me, God, I'm going to come back to you. And then there's the man who says, I don't, I don't want you. I, I won't be changed. He stands, not changed, doesn't pray, instead stays. My will be done. I want what I want. It's my life. I'm a self-made man. I've earned everything I've got. All these things, I bow to none. Here's the deal. God in his love for us, in his desire for us to love him in return, for sending his son to die in our place for our sins on the cross, God gives us a choice. And he gives us the freedom to pray and to be changed by his spirit and to inherit everything, all that is Christ. Or we're free to stay the way we are not be changed, and then to inherit all that comes with the world, sin and death with it. Jesus touched on this same idea in Matthew, in chapter 13, verse 11. People couldn't understand as he's speaking in parables, and the disciples are like, how how come, what do you, why do you speak in parables? And then he explained to his disciples, he says, "You've, you've been permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others have not. And listen, This is important because this is crucial to understanding this. In verse 12, Matthew 13, Jesus says, To those who are open to my teaching, more understanding will be given. Is that awesome? You know, be open to the Lord. Be be there when it's there. And he says, and they'll they'll get more understanding and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But to those who are not listening, even what they have will be taken away from them. Think about it. Sometimes people think, oh, I've heard that before. I've heard this message before, Pastor. I've read that before. I've taught that before. Who cares? You know? So you're not listening? (laughs) Even what you have can be taken away. And And it's pride that says those things. And so the whole idea here is that if Jesus didn't blind the eyes and stop up the ears of the proud, those that didn't want to believe thought that they're good enough, but then they wouldn't have it. They wouldn't have a choice but to believe. They, they, they would have followed him, but out of coercion or compulsion rather than just in love. I mean, he, for you and I, those of you guys that are married, you know, you want your wife to love you because she adores you. You are awesome. You're wonderful. You are handsome. You are strong. You're a provider. You want her to love you because of who you are. Not because, you know, you, 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 you hold a gun to her head or, or, or I mean we've all heard the story and I'm sure none of you whoops, none of you did some of you might have had to to get a bride but <laughs> others of you thinking that maybe that would work no. but it's like we've all heard it before you know that you know if God were to pop his head up over the clouds and in all of his glory say here I am 
You know, Jesus is real. He died for you. Follow him or else. You know, then it wouldn't be him and his love that draws us to him, but it would just be fear. You step over here or you die. Even then, even in the in the tribulation period, we see that God is going to send his angels through the heavens proclaiming the gospel and warning of the mark of the beast. And God will honor their man's choice. And he will place a delusion, we read, on some knowing their choice that they will continue in believing the lie when it comes. Now, does that mean that if you don't accept Jesus Christ now and you've heard the gospel message that you won't be able to receive him in the midst of the tribulation period? I can't say for sure no, but I don't know. So I wouldn't want to take any chances on and risk my place in eternity and, and, a, and a place here through the tribulation period. And the price, you think about it again, it's too great. The risk of missing out on everything that God has to offer and the judgment to come for a chance. You guys, it's, it's not, it doesn't stand a chance. That kind of work, that kind of wish, you guys, is futile. That's why Paul is writing here. Look at verse 15. He says, so then, brothers, stand firm. Stand firm. Oni pa'a. I mean, if we were at a church on one Sunday morning, morning a little while back, and I was announcing for the guys to sign up for the men's camp coming up, and I said, and the theme is Oni pa'a, and I forgot what it meant, you know? You know? So I was thankful for our Hawaiian contingent. What's that mean? Now stand firm. And I was like, all right, you know. But, but here's the thing. It's stand firm. Stand firm and hold on. You guys, we're those that have to hold on. And what do you hold on to? You guys, we hold on to the teachings, Paul says. The teachings that have been passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. You guys, again, teachings that we have right here this morning. Th this is it. And, and look at verse 16. And he says, And may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who himself loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. How, how does he do that? Through the teachings that we have here. That's how we get encouraged. That's how we come back and we, and we build again right here. And encourage your, encourage your hearts. He goes, and strengthen you in every good deed and word. And I thought, you guys, this is what it's about. I need his hope. I need his encouragement. I get it from his word. And the world is hard, and it's, it's going to be getting even harder and darker. We see it already crazy how things have changed in the last 20 years blows my mind things you would never expect and your family and those that you love need to see you and i standing firm and holding on and some of you are waffling and wavering and you're here this morning and you know you came to camp but but there's things in your life you know there's the the opala you know as strad said i love that it's only Paula or opala you want trash or you want to stand firm what are you standing on your kids see it your family sees it and, and, and for the love of Christ himself, who desires for you as his bride, you guys, get rid of that stuff. Some of you guys, go home today and tell your wife, this is out. We're getting rid of this. We're unplugging that. Whatever needs to go. Because this is too important, especially when you consider our children. And when you see churches that are hanging on to all the frills, the bride in love with the bride, it's so much so. You know, and nothing wrong with, with nice lights and, you know, and, and you know, a smoke machine. I don't, I don't know, but, but, you know, you know, the, you know, the sound and comfortable chairs and the lighting dims and, you know, whatever, you know, it's, it's, there's, some, there's good stuff there, but, but all in its place, when it becomes all about the, the frills and all about the stuff, next thing you know, it's easier to get into other stuff. You start, you know, frolicking with, with things that are not found in the Bible. I mean, Paul describes it in 1 Timothy 4, 1. God clearly says, the Spirit, He is God, the Spirit Himself clearly says that in the last days, some will abandon the faith and they will follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. It's literally demonic, the stuff that's happening in so many churches today. And that's rad. So the question comes, who are they? Who are they if in the last days there are those that are that are teaching doctrines of demons, abandoning the faith. That means they had faith, so now they're walked away from faith. And so there's there's a portion of the church, as Tim mentioned, that apostasy in the last days that's falling away. Who are they? You guys, it isn't that we need to be, you know, identifying them and going picketing out in front of churches, but, you know, we should be perfectly clear that 
It's your place to tell your friends that are caught up in funky, funky teaching, demonic doctrines, churches that have gotten away from the Bible, gotten into all kinds of weird, wacky stuff. You guys, it's your place to tell them, hey, you know what? Get out of there. Show them the truth. If you don't, you're not a friend. Friends don't let friends do drugs. You remember that commercial a while back, you know? Well, friends don't let friends. Brothers don't let brothers, you know, wallow their time away and see their children be lost in a church that isn't teaching God's word. Amen. And and it's and you think about this too. Listen. He says he says, "Hold on. Look at verse 15 again." Brothers, he says, "Be brothers, standing firm, holding on to the teachings passed on to us." By word of mouth. That's what you receive every Sunday morning, every midweek study. I hope you go. You guys, last night, today, tomorrow, what we are hearing, hang on to the things that you know when it comes to the word of God. Listen to K-Light. I sell, I'm, I am the biggest promoter of K-Light on Maui. Maybe that there is. I mean, Sunday morning, listen to K-Light. Turn your stinking radio to K-Light and get God's word. You know, I don't care if I'm on there. I mean, it's kind of weird. It really is weird, you know. But my granddaughter, sounds like Papa. <laughs> but you guys, it's God's word. K-Light's better. You know what? I mean, I'll, I'll just say it. You know, don't, don't let anybody know. We're like Vegas here. What goes on here stays here, right? I think K-Light's better than K-Wave. You know? I mean, I mean, K-Wave in California. Hey, it is. It's solid. There's so much teaching. K-Light AM, you can't beat it. Positive, encouraging. K-Love. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know I, there's, so, there's some good there, but, but gosh, what do you want? You know, what do you really want? Positive, encouraging, or do you need a slap in the face today? You know, turn on K Light. Listen to Pastor Z. You know, <laughs> I was telling some guy last night I can offend more people you know, on the radio, <laughs> but you guys, it's just true. And so he, you know, he and he says here by word of mouth or by letter. And so what's that? It's what you're reading. What are you reading? Are you reading your Bibles? And watch, as we get in here, he began with prayer, hopeful concern for the brothers there. Now Paul ends with this exhortation, or he begins into an exhortation and a plea for them to be praying for him. And I love this. Chapter 3, verse 1, finally, brothers, pray. Pray for us. And this is so awesome, because if you read through Paul's letters, this is one of his many themes, you could say, throughout most of his letters. Paul, the great, the powerful apostle, asked for prayer. And, and I say this is awesome because this is the heart that honors God, and therefore, God honors it. God honors that heart that prays. And just as the heart that understands, you know, I am completely dependent on God in everything, God says, I, I want to bless you with everything that you need. And that heart is often going to be humbled. And so it should often be asking for prayer, for prayer on our behalf. And, and God loves it. He honors your prayers. Pray for your pastors. Pray for your pastors. I, I I probably don't end a Sunday sermon in the park, especially with the visitors we have at second service, without saying, hey, pray for Calvary Chapel. Pray for our church. Would you pray for us? Pray for me. You guys, it's so important. I got some for you. 74574 Pastor. Every one of you guys should do this today. Text Pastor, P A S T O R. Not pasture, you know, <laughs> out to pasture. That's where some of us go, you know, but, but pastor to 74574. And it is so cool. You will get every day. It says you can sign up for weekly or daily. Sign up for daily. Every day you get a little text that says, pray for your pastor. And I got to read you this. This is too so cool. Come on. Come to me, baby. Don't fail me now. Oh, there's the back of Bill's head. I love that song. I'll tell you why I took a picture of the back of Bill's head at the end here. here this, was, this is one, I mean, there's so many of This is one from the day that I shared my testimony this last week, uh, which part of my testimony is Ephesians 4.30. I don't have time to get into it, but that's my verse. You know, don't grieve the Holy Spirit by the way that you live. That's what I was doing. That verse, God captured me with it. On the day that I was going to share my testimony at our church, at the at the end of all these people for weeks and weeks sharing their testimonies on Tuesday nights, Testimony Tuesdays, here it is. 
Pray today for your pastor's sensitivity to God and others that they would not grieve the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4.30. That was on the day that I was going to share my testimony. My wife said, did you see that? You guys, but I tell you, and I don't have time to get into them. It's so good. So many times it's like, man, that's what I need today. I hope my people are praying for me. You guys, it will encourage you every day to, listen, is it bad to pray more? And, and it's not one of those things. It's one of the better things that I've seen like that. It's not something to go, oh, no, here we go, this thing. I wish I never would have downloaded this. You guys, you can opt out. It gives you that chance off and on, but it's so good. Your pastors need prayer. We need prayer. Jesus said it about as clearly as you can get in Luke eleven nine. Speaking of prayer, he said, ask. Ask, he says, for ev- ask and it will be given to you. He said, for everyone who asks, receives. And so if you think about it here, considering this, that Paul, you know, he really had the right idea here so that he was going to get everyone that he possibly could in each of his letters to be praying for him and for his team. We should be lined up when it comes for times of prayer. Paul knew that he needed to cover his ministry with prayer. In Romans fifteen thirty, he said, I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I might be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea. Pray that my service in Jerusalem might be acceptable to the saints. Pray so that God's, by God's will I might come to you with joy and together with you be refreshed. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, Paul said, And as you help us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted in answer to the prayers, your prayers, the prayers of many. Ephesians 6.18, Paul said, Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. And verse 19, pray also for me so that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me. I love that. When God gives you words when you're in the pulpit, you guys pray for your pastors for that. Words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Blow people's minds. All of a sudden, it's the mystery. Remember, it's the, we have the mystery revealed in Jesus Christ, for which he says, I'm an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. You guys, that should be our prayer for our pastors. Pray this the, for those, and pray this for those pastors that have wandered and that are watering down the gospel for, for numbers and popularity. Pray that they would repent, you know, and be fearless. I just saw a thing about a guy that was in that, you guys seen that American gospel, you know, video thing? Anyway, it talks about a lot of the funky stuff going on in the church these days. Benny Hinn's nephew is one of the guys in it sharing about it. And, and there's this guy who, fearless. And he's, he's, he's laying it out clear. But all of a sudden, this guy showed me yesterday, one of the guys from our church, he looked at this guy. He just apologized to Stephen Furtick. He just apologized for, for talking about his ministry, which, you guys, is sideways. Okay? To, and that's to, that's to make it kind. I'm being kind. It's sideways. And I look at these things, and I think, gosh, you guys, you guys, we need to be praying for all that we can. Listen to this. This is so good. He says, Colossians 4.3. Pray again, all over the world. You look at Paul's letters. Pray for us. He says, pray for us. Pray that God may open a door for our message. Pray that we may proclaim it clearly. Proclaim the mystery of Christ clearly. May I, that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. And so he's talking about in Ephesians that we'd be fearless. We'd proclaim it fearlessly. Here he says, proclaiming it clearly. In 1 Thessalonians 5, brothers, he just says, pray for us. Paul knew the power, he knew the importance, he knew the potential of the prayers of the saints. And I think most of us do too, but most of us don't, myself included, don't pray as much as we could or should maybe. Especially when it comes to the presentation of the gospel, I love it. Fearless and clearly proclaiming it. Charles Spurgeon, most of you know of him, 1800s. You know, the late 1800s was packing out the 7,000-seat Metropolitan Tabernacle in England, in London. And as the story goes, one day he was helping out with some cleaning, and he was wearing a pair of, like, bib overalls and just cleaning up around the church. And these preachers and pastors came to check out the church and then to hear him preach that evening. And one of them saw him there and saw him dressed as he was and didn't think that he would be Spurgeon's. And he thought he was a janitor, and he said, hey... He says, could you show us the power plant of this huge structure? You know, looking, you know, where's the boiler room for this big old, where's the heater here, you know? And, and so he walks them down into the basement, 
And as they get there where they're expecting to see some great furnace or something, he opened up the door at the end of a long hallway and there were 200 men. And I circled men about five times here and put a heart by it. You know, I love this. 200 real men on their knees praying for their pastor, praying for their service that was coming up that evening. And he looked and he said to them, prayer, gentlemen, is the power plant of the Metropolitan Tabernacle. You guys, I believe for our ministry at Calvary Chapel in Lahaina, I believe so much of what carries me in our church the last 27 years has been the prayers of visitors. People that God has brought to the park and touched their lives and they pull out the bulletin, you know, years later when they're visiting again. Hey, look, I keep this in my Bible, so I remember to pray for you. You guys, we should be doing that for our pastors. You know, when it comes to prayer before our service on Sunday morning, there's usually two or three people there. Two or three people there. You know, it's sad. You know, what would God do if our congregation said, if you guys, at your, if every guy here showed up for prayer at your church, if you don't have it already, institute it. Your pastor, yeah, come pray for me. What would happen? What would God do? You guys, he, Spurgeon said this as well. He says, when, when asked of the secret of his influence and in preaching and his ministry, he, Spurgeon said, my people pray for me. My people pray for me. There's a book. You should all read it. It's real small. You can get it on, you know, whatever to Kindle for 99 cents or something. J.C. Ryle, Do You Pray? So convicting and so good. Do you pray? He goes through a little thing about life. Well, do you pray? So good. You guys, prayer is where the power is or it's not. Look at what Paul says. Again, pray for us. Chapter 3, verse 1, the message of the Lord might spread rapidly, be honored. Here it is, just as it was with you. That the message might spread rapidly. Where is it going to go? Again, just as it was with you. He's saying, pray that our hearts might be ready to receive Jesus. That others' hearts, I should say, might be ready to receive Jesus, just like you did. Just as it was with you, that the message others would be touched the way that you were. And I love this too. Notice as well, he doesn't say pray for the programs, pray for the projects, nothing wrong with that. But he says, pray for our message, pray for our preaching. And again, this is the Apostle Paul. So think, think with me on this here. How much more do we need to be praying for the preaching of those in ministry today? Praying that the Lord tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning in your church, the same God that empowered Paul, he would pour his spirit out on, on Tim and on Bill and on Bud and on in any one of us, you know? You guys... What would God do if we would just believe him for it? And I think the problem is maybe you don't believe him for it. I know I have my doubts too. But he always comes through when we do what he asks. And anyone who's ever been, again, as I said to our service, you know, they know I'm always asking them, pray for me, pray for me. I mean, my, my sound like what? Like, I, I need help. I do. That's right. I do. I mean, we all do. And again, for the delivery of your message, for the receiving of it. You guys, that God would open up the ears and open up the eyes. And look at verse 2. Pray that we might be delivered from the wicked from wicked and evil men. For everyone, not everyone has faith. Deliver us from the evil and the wicked because everybody's not so nice. Everybody doesn't have faith. One of the guarantees, one of the promises of any real ministry is that there will be people that will come against you. Wicked, evil men. If you really are representing Jesus, you know, you, you have a target on you. And, and, and for, it'll come from without. As, as Bill talked about last night, it'll come from the outside. But sadly, it comes from the inside as well. I've had more lies and things spread about me by brothers. Oh, yeah. I lo- oh, I love, we love Pastor Steve. We love Pastor Steve. But... It's like, you know, it's like, listen, if you ever hear anybody say that about me, just pop them. No, 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 just put your arm around them. No, don't pop them, you know. Let God do it. Let God do it. Put your arm around them, and you walk them up to, to your pastor or whoever it is. Say, hey, well, let's, let's go talk to, to Pastor Steve about this. Anybody comes, and they're talking about their brother. That's scriptural. You know, bring them to your brother, and that's usually where you lose them. I mean, literally, like, oh, oh, my wife, I just remembered, I got to go, you know. And they will probably never talk to you again about any such the matter, at least. And so Paul's in the thick of it. And you think about this, he's in the thick of it, 
But he keeps on. He's doing what he's calling us to do. Stand fast and hold on. Hold on to what you know. In Genesis chapter 26, we were there on Tuesday or Wednesday and Thursday night at our Bible studies. And, and, and Isaac is Abraham's dad. Isaac is now, you know, running with Rebecca, his wife. They've just got their two kids, you know, which, you know, there's some struggles and things going on there. Uh, but Isaac is in a place where um, he uh, he's, he's in the land of Gerar, and the king there is a friend, but not so much when all of a sudden everything starts to go better with Isaac. His flocks are growing. You know, and his herds are growing, and his and and he's his 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 fields are growing, and there's a famine in the land. And how come he's being blessed and they're not doing so good? And so Abimelech the king says, "Hey, why don't you leave?" You know, and so he leaves, but he doesn't go far because God didn't tell him to leave. He's finally starting to listen to God, kind of there. And so he go, doesn't go far, but he goes a little ways away. And then Abimelech's guys start going out and burying all of Abraham, his father's wells that he had dug. And so all these wells, the reason, again, Abraham, Isaac's flocks, I should say, were, were well watered because they had wells. You guys, we have wells right here in our hands. Your Bible, that's the well you drink from. You know, when you're well watered, you will grow. You know, and, and so in this, though, Abimelech's guys go start filling up all the wells of Abraham with dirt. The enemy always wants to throw dirt on the ministry of God. He does, especially on the word of God, any way he can. And ministers, you know, the media is always looking for dirt against pastors. That said, they fill up all the wells. And so it's so cool. Isaac goes back and he starts digging up. And, and he said, you know, I drank from these wells as a young man. I was a little boy. I, I was refreshed at these wells. And he goes back and he digs up the wells again. And then, and then he renames them what Abraham, his father, had named them. And so he's remembering those past things. He's, he's, he's going back and, and living what he knew was good. You guys, when it comes to the word of God that God's ministered to you before in your life, go back to those scriptures. Underline them in your Bible and highlight them and you know, put them on your refrigerator or what have you. And, and go back to those things and be refreshed by them often. And the enemy will try to say, oh, that's not for you. That's not for you anymore. And then what, it, what Isaac did. So then those guys, they came and they, they wouldn't let him drink from those wells. And so they started digging more wells, Isaac did. And as he digs more wells, what happens? But the enemy comes and goes, oh, that's our well, you know. And he's like, okay. And he leaves it. And he goes and he digs another well. And the enemy says, that's our well too, you know. And, and he, so he goes and he, and he goes on until finally he digs a well and, and, and the Lord tells him, you know, they don't come after him. And it's their well. And he says, this is the well of promise. This is the well where there's room for you. You guys, the Lord, he, all that to say this. The enemy's going to come against you over and over and over in your life. And, and you're being refreshed by God's word. Even this morning, that mountaintop experience kind of thing, you know. The enemy's going to try to throw dirt on what God's done here. You keep digging. You don't stop. You keep going till you've got the promise of God. And we'll show when that comes as we end here. Just a moment. Watch. Look at um, in verse, uh, verse. oh, you know what? Here real quick. This is cool. Uh, Paul's going through it. Some love him. Some hate him. You've all heard it before, you know. Wherever he went, there was riot or revival or both, you know. And, uh, and Jesus said it. They hated me. They're going to hate you. Men love darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil, evil and they, they run away from the light. You know, they're like cockroaches, you know. Uh, in Acts 17, when Paul was chased out of Thessalonica, this is cool. Bill mentioned it last night. They rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, King, New King, or Old King James Version, lewd fellows of the baser sort. I mean, Bill mentioned that. You like that? And those that pisseth against the wall. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> But I had that in my notes already. I, I had that in my notes. You know, they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace and formed a mob. New King or King James Version, I added in there in parentheses, lewd fellows of the baser sort. That's confirmation. Bill shared it. I shared it. And you know it. They're, they're all over. They're bad characters that want to rip you off. When you live for Christ like Paul, 
Foreman mobs rioting away. I mean, we, we see that already in our nation. And, in, and here they're coming in search of Paul and Silas to bring them out to the angry crowd. And so Paul says, pray for us. Pray that the word will go forth and for all those that come against us to go away. You know, Pray that for your pastors, the attacks that come and will. Because not everyone, as we see there, end of verse 2, has faith. But, verse 3, doesn't matter what everyone else has. We have the Lord. And the Lord is faithful. And he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things that we command. And so, listen carefully here. Because this is, this is a key to our understanding what it really is to be a growing and victorious Christian. I believe it with all my heart. That to understand, my confidence isn't in me. My confidence is in the Lord. It isn't in ourselves, but it's in our Lord. Confidence in the Lord that He's going to continue to do. And when I realize that, and when I remind myself of it because I need to, all of a sudden the burden is taken off of me. And it's where it belongs, where Jesus wanted it, on him. Cast your cares on me. You know, I mean, I mean, he says, I'm the Lord, I'm faithful. He has strength, I need it. And so it's not about what a great Christian you are or you can become, but it's about what a great God he is and all that he's overcome in your life and mine. What's so cool about this too, it goes over into your ministry. It goes over into your marriage. I don't have to worry about, you know, my kids. You know, as I raise them up right, God is faithful. He'll strengthen them. He's going to protect them from the evil one. The enemy always gets us worried. Oh, my gosh, my kids, coronavirus, we need to buy masks. Amazon is sold out, you know, unless you want to buy them for like 10 times what they were selling for the day before. You guys, I look at this and I think, you know, guys, God is so good. And we have no doubt we can be confident. Well, where do we get the confidence? From the word. You start to get afraid when you get away from the word. I mean, and we're just, again, we're just like Isaac in, in Genesis 26. In the beginning of the chapter, God recounts his, his promise to Abraham that is now his. He's going to be fruitful and multiply and have children and be blessed and protected and all these things. And just a, one verse after God finishes his, his recount of all that, Isaac gets afraid and he tells Abimelech as he comes into that area of the land, they said, oh, hey, so who's this? Who's that woman? Oh, she's my sister. It was his wife. I mean, and he's doing the same thing that his dad did twice before. You guys, we end up running for uh, afraid when we forget what God has just said to us. You, you watch and remember after. Some of you this afternoon, this evening, when you get home, all of a sudden, something's going to come and you're like, oh, no. I mean, we I had a couple, I mean, gosh, I had a couple. We've had 27 families that have left our church. We didn't have a church split. They just split. They moved to Texas. You know, they moved to, away to the mainland because they can't afford West Maui. Families, 27 families. It's like, oh, what are we going to do? I don't know, finances are kind of running thin and running out, and we're kind of waiting and seeing what's God going to do. But I'm not afraid, because God has a plan. He's, he, he's going to take care of us, and if it means taking us back to the park full time, oh, how shameful, we're just going to be in the park now and not have a building again. You know, it's like, you know, you know what? I mean, <laughs> I really like having a building for our kids at the same time. I'm going to trust God. Don't test me on that, Lord. But but, I would, but but how many of us, you know, we need. But but you know, but you get you get back in the Word. You're afraid and whatever, and you get back to. That's why they call your church, you know, the, the when you where you go to hear the Word, a sanctuary. It's where all of a sudden, gosh, I'm okay in the sanctuary of His presence. I can be confident. I can be confident for those of you who belong to Jesus. He's going to be faithful. Even if we're not, he's faithful. And even as there are those that will come against you, you know, I can know, I can have confidence. Jesus, you know, is doing and will continue to grow me and you in what is right. And so, listen, with our eyes and with our hearts open, brothers standing firm and holding on together, which is so important to the teachings passed on to us, whether by word of mouth, what we're hearing today, or by letter, 
your time in reading the word. I mean, we've got the word of God in our hands. In verse 5, may the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance, the one-two punch that, that lifts you up and takes out the enemy. God's love and Christ's perseverance. Basically, the idea, our victories are going to be found in, as the, the New Living Translation reads here, I, I like this, I don't really use that much, but I, I like this. An ever deeper understanding of the love of God and the endurance that comes from Christ. Ever deeper understanding of the love of God. You know, and in that, in an ever deeper understanding of the love of God, I know I'm okay. He loves me. You know, he loves me. And then the endurance that comes from Christ. He fills me. He carries me. He walks with me and he talks with me. And what does he do? What's the next thing? And he tells me I am his own. You guys, that's so cool. I'm his. What, 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 what weapon is formed against us? You know, it's not going to prosper. And here's the, the very real thing, though. We all know it. Satan, so often, he comes with doubt. He comes with questions. He challenges God's love for you. I mean, I, at least he does with me at times. And because of our failings, our very real failings, our lack of, of the perfect love that we know that we ought to have as Christians, you and I become, you know, guilty Targets. We are just these easy, guilty targets for the enemy. You know, you know, at Target, the store, the big Target thing out in front. I drove up the other day, and I and I saw that in, our, in Maui. And I'm like, gosh, I feel like that's me. You know, <laughs> it's like, but it's it's that big. You just, I feel like I know the enemy hates what I do, what you do. But God loves you, and 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 the enemy says, well, if He loves you, why would He allow this in your life? And we become a target of the enemy. And what Satan does so well is he seeks to cause us to question God's love, to question God's forgiveness and his faithfulness, at least in your life. Because you know you haven't been as faithful as you should. And you've struggled. And and he'll sometimes even use saints or, or saints that ain't, you could say. <laughs> Or sideways saints, you know, they're just, they're, they're saints, but they're confused. They come along, you know, oh, brother, if you only had enough faith, you know, with the big smile, you know, <laughs> thanks a lot. You know, th there must be something wrong in your relationship with God, you know. Yeah, there always is, you know, <laughs> there's, it's like we struggle. But, but here, and what happens though is don't be one either. Listen, there's those that come along and they, they give you counsel. And they, every, so many Christians want to be counselors, you know. And it's like, and they're shoot, but they're shooting from the hip. They're just, well, here's what I think. Without opening their Bible, without asking God, here's what I think. And they have, lay heavy burdens on you. And some of them, not, not purposefully, but it just because they're just they're they're, they're mixed up. They're they're sideways, like I said. They're not grounded in the Word. And so Paul says, here here's the answer: Let God direct you. May God direct your heart. Listen, for you men this morning, for me, God, direct our hearts. Let God direct your heart. How does he do it? His word. Really simple. Let God direct your heart. Where? Into his love. Into the love of God. And then that God does love you. Despite my failings, you guys, he, and he's working in the circumstances, even the issues and my struggles. Back in Genesis 26 again, Isaac tells us, she's my sister. You know, and what? And then Abimelech. Why did you say she's your sister? Obviously, you're caressing her. You know, you're showing her endearment. All these different translations. I love the, the old King James there. I saw you sporting with your wife. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> pissing against the wall. I don't know. But, but you know, but here he, can, he says, I know. I was afraid you're going to kill me. And so I said, she's my sister. He confessed. And then God blesses him. Abimelech says, hey, anybody that touches this man or his wife, you know, <laughs> dies. God covered him, even though he was a knucklehead. I mean, you see that all throughout the word. And so again, may the Lord direct your steps. May he, may he grow you and I in that place of understanding his perseverance and his promises. The very sure love of God and Christ's perseverance. You guys, he's always working in our lives. He's always persevering within you and I. And that's the one-two punch, as I said. And this is something that we all painfully basically discover. That if we persevere, 
long enough, got to work it out. How many things have you been through? Oh no, but but you persevered, or you've you know, or you've you know, complained your way through it even you know. But by God's grace, He works it out, and in the end, that's what He does with this world, and all these amazing things that we see in His Word, and the terrible things that we see in this world, will be worked out. Don't let the enemy freak you out. But we just wait, standing firm, holding on together, trusting. Amen? And God's got this. God's got this. And I, I want to end and close with this, though. Because this this verse here, verse 5, can also be clearly and contextually read. Old King James Version. Love it. Got to get it. The Lord, Let the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. And get this. Ready? Into the patient waiting for Jesus Christ. Patiently waiting for. So patiently waiting for Jesus Christ. So if you think about it, this is how we're to be persevering in Christ. Patiently waiting for him. And most of those that I know that persevere, persevere well, most easily in Christ, seem like they got it together more than me. Listen. They are those that are expectantly, patiently waiting for Jesus Christ. Trusting in Him. Waiting and trusting for Him to work. Waiting and trusting for Him to come. Understanding that the American dream is a dream. <laughs> it, listen, happily ever after is always at the end of the story. It's at the end. It is, And, and we, we want it now. God says, it's coming. I'm coming. And, 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 we're, and we're getting close. And so we're not looking for the Antichrist as, as, as a, what's your name, Tim? <laughs> Let's close with this. Something really stupid. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was praying earlier, Lord, just, let, just humble me. I, wanna, I want you to touch people whenever I teach, but, but Lord, keep me humble. And he does. He does. But here it is, patiently waiting for Jesus, patiently waiting, faithfully praying, and, and in that, praying for your pastor, strengthened and protected, convinced and standing and holding on together to God's word, and, and God's word only, and listening to no other words, only God's word. Text 74574, pastor. To 74574. And I want to share with you why I took a picture of Bill's head real quick here. Where are we at here? 1124. Am I in there good still? No. no? We're way over. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, this is this Bill's picture. My heart longs for the living God. That was it. You know what? His heart longs for you. He longs for you. He wants after you and I so badly. Let's pray real fast. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this morning. And I thank you for Tim's grace. And, uh, and Lord, uh, for yours, Lord, in our lives. Lord, rise us up. Make us men that, that kneel down. Lord, rise us up and make us men that stand together, Lord, believing you with your word in hand, or with the things that we've heard in heart. And, Lord, uh, do a great work in these men. In Jesus' name.